Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at choosewood.com. If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. This made them a lot of money. And um, I think that, you know, I don't think there was any sort of evidence that Major League Baseball had at the moment that Mark McGuire or Sammy Sosa or Barry Bonds or any of those guys were using steroids. I don't think they had something in their arsenal that they were hiding. I think they were choosing to not find that evidence. Down the left field line, is it enough? Gone! There it is! 62! Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a woman and I've always loved baseball. I've always loved home runs. Um, I think it would be so cool to hit a home run, which is not something I'm physically capable of. <laughs> and maybe there's an admiration of that. I'm Sarah Fenske. This is St. Louis on the Air. Joan Neeson's new podcast starts with a story a lot of former St. Louis kids can likely identify with. The story starts when she was 10 years old, and it's about baseball. When you love a sport the way I loved baseball, you know exactly when you got hooked. The year, the game, maybe even the exact play. You remember it in slow motion. The light, the colors, the sounds. In my story, that moment came on September 8th, 1998. A Tuesday night in my hometown, St. Louis. A gorgeous night for baseball. Very hot. Very my favorite player, Mark McGuire was one home run away from breaking the most sacred record in sports. I'm wondering if this is the at-bat that Mark McGuire moves one place in front of Roger Maris. I was at a friend's house that night, and we were glued to the TV. I was sitting on a toy rocking horse, which looked like something from a carousel, white and pink, with a gold pole I held onto while I swayed back and forth, praying for a home run. And then... I jumped off the horse, threw my arms in the air. The horse rocked forward, then back, and the pole smacked me square in the mouth. I tasted something chalky. A sliver of my front tooth had chipped off. But I couldn't have cared less. And you will always know where you are at 8.18 p.m. Central Time, September 8, 1998. Joan Neeson is a former Sports Illustrated staff writer, and her podcast isn't just about falling in love with baseball. It's about falling out of it, about how the 1998 home run race that thrilled her as a child was later revealed to be a steroid-fueled scandal. Joan's podcast is called Crushed, and it's a production of PRX and Religion of Sports. And joining us today to talk about it is Joan Neeson. Joan, welcome. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So that moment of Mark McGuire's home run, it must be seared in your brain and your mouth. Do you still have that <laughs> chip tooth? <laughs> I, I do. You know, and I, I don't want to oversell it. It's not something that you really would notice unless you were looking for it. It's very, very tiny. Um, but, but I do. <laughs> and you, you can feel it in there. I mean, every time you feel it, do you go back to that date, that September? You know, I think a lot about baseball um, as a sports writer, and uh, that was the moment that that hooked me with the sport and probably led to me, you know, doing the job I've been doing for the past decade. So yeah, I, I do think about it a lot. <laughs> so that was the moment. You were already 10 at that point, maybe came later to the game than some young St. Louisans. Did you grow up in a baseball family? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, I was I was always a Cardinals fan as a kid in, in the way that any, you know, kid can be. You don't know that much about what's going on, but you go to games and you love it. Um, yeah. And the podcast talks a little bit about my family and how my dad especially just really instilled this love of baseball um, in me and my brother. Hmm. So take us back to 1998, this pivotal year for you and also for baseball's record book. Uh, were the Cardinals any good that year? Not not really, <laughs> um, which is, I know, sort of unfamiliar territory over the past you know couple of decades. But this was kind of right before they got good, right before sort of those Albert Pujols, Jim Edmonds, Scott Rowland years. And 
that year, I, I have a math brain, despite being a journalist, which I know is sort of uncommon in it our is field. Unusual. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I loved all the math of that summer. And one of my favorite things that I loved looking at was how far under 500 the Cardinals were, and if they could possibly just be a winning team, which I think they, I think they were a 500 team by the end of the year, but just barely. They were not, not a playoff team. Hmm. So this wouldn't have been such a big year. Maybe it wouldn't have been the year that hooked you if not for this home run race. So remind us of what was all going on at that point because there was a lot it, it wasn't even just Mark McGuire chasing this record yeah and I think that was a big part of it that it wasn't just Mark McGuire Sammy Sosa in Chicago was also sort of hot on his heels for the whole summer um, at the beginning of the year Ken Griffey Jr. in in Seattle was also sort of in the mix but he he fell off and it was really Mark and Sammy um, down the stretch and so there was that Cardinals Cubs rivalry that everyone was you know I think everyone enjoys to you know loves to hate and um that played into it, and baseball had just come off um, a strike in, in 94, 95, and was really struggling to kind of reestablish itself after all that labor unrest. I think for the first time, the sentiment had sort of swung against players. Players were viewed as somewhat greedy, I think, by the general public, um, mm-hmm. and because they had, you know, denied fans baseball for a little while. And I think that summer really helped, you know, bring baseball back and in some ways save baseball after a really disastrous labor negotiation. So this wasn't just media hype. This was something that attendance was up. People were way into this. Very much so. Yeah. Attendance dipped after the strike and then it just sort of kept skyrocketing. Um, 98, 99, 2000, 2001, you know, just attendance records. And um, yeah, it made a lot of people a lot of money. Hmm. So this all goes back to the excitement of home runs. And in your podcast, you explore just what makes home runs so special. In football, we remember the quarterbacks with cannons. We watch tennis and we're awed by fast serves. In hockey, slap shots. In basketball, dunks. But in the pantheon of power, I don't think anything tops the home run. Frank Cusimano agrees. I mean, there's an infatuation with brute strength and raw power. When you see an exit velocity of 120 miles an hour catching up with a 98 mile an hour fastball, I mean, that's the essence of masculinity. And that's Frank Cusimano. He's the sports director of KSDK and a radio host at KFNS. Uh, You're a female fan of baseball, Joan. Do you think he's right that this is all tied up in sort of the, the masculine ethos? That's a great question. And um, I think there is an element of that sort of macho masculine culture that plays into the home run, um, especially back then when, you know, we were it was it hadn't been too long since sort of the, you know, late 80s, early 90s. Everything was very, you know, pumped up. And uh, I think this sort of is an outgrowth of that. But to me, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a woman and I've always loved baseball. I've always loved home runs. Um, I think it would be so cool to hit a home run, which is not something I'm physically capable of. <laughs> and maybe there's an admiration of that, too, where it's like the power and the masculinity. I don't know that I'm ad- admirable or I'm admiring masculinity necessarily, but the power of it all is, is really intoxicating. Mm-hmm. And it's also it's just such an exciting moment. The fact that, you know, it can literally change a game with one stroke. I mean, it's not just showing off like this. This is a game changer. Totally, totally. And I think that's why this has been such a big deal in baseball for decades and decades. So this record, up to the point of this 1998 series, this was held by Roger Maris, who I feel like a lot of people today have forgotten about Roger Maris, but he had set this 37 years before. You interviewed for your podcast, you interviewed Roger Maris Jr. about how he felt about this single season home run record being broken. You never want to see your dad's record fall. I mean, obviously, it was a, to me, I think it was one of the greatest records in sports. So you clearly don't want that to happen. But you also realize that records are made to be broken. And now dad said that once. He said it a thousand times that, you know, I'm just like he broke Roos' record. And, you know, someday somebody might break his record. And that is Roger Maris Jr. Um, He was interviewed for the new podcast Crushed, which is a production of PRX and Religion of Sports. And we're talking today to the host of that podcast. That's Joan Neeson, St. Louis native. Joan, we know now that that record was broken with the aid of anabolic steroids. Did that change how Roger Maris Jr. felt about it? Did that seem like cheating to him, that, that, that that's what broke his father's record? You know, I think it did. Um, I think that 
I think that was a really interesting time for their family because his dad had faced a lot of adversity while breaking the record because the record prior to that was held by Babe Ruth mm-hmm. and a lot of people did not want to see Babe Ruth's record fall. So I think the home run record was always a pretty fraught thing for, for the Maris family, even though it was this wonderful achievement that their father um, had accomplished. But um, but yeah, I think that I think that Roger Maris Jr., he says in the podcast, he, he watched that summer and in the back of his mind was thinking, look at these guys. They look... Um, they look like they're juicing, and uh, he, as a as a former you know athlete, not not he never played in the majors, but he was an athletic guy who had spent time in gyms, and he knew that anabolic steroids were, were kind of everywhere. And so he says in the podcast, you know, he doesn't want to spoil the fun. He didn't want to feel like make everyone think that he was just a sore loser. So they didn't he didn't say anything at the time. He and his family, but. I think it was a tough moment to watch that and sort of suspect, oh, what's going on here? Hmm. It's interesting. We asked our listeners on our St. Louis on the Air Facebook page for their memories of this season. And Brad wrote, quote, I remember looking at those guys at the time and thinking, that's not baseball, that's steroids, and being disgusted that everybody was cheering for cheaters. In some ways, was this kind of an open secret at the time? And it was just the 10-year-olds who didn't know what was really up. You know, you know, as the former 10-year-old, I, I didn't have a clue what was up. That said, I think it was and it wasn't. I think that, you know, Brad, obviously, was able to look at that through a pretty objective lens. I don't think a lot of people do that with sports. I think that sports cloud our vision because we love these teams and these players in um, really, you know, extraordinary ways. And we, we can't quite see them for what they are sometimes. So... People weren't really quite yet talking about steroids in 1998, unless they were, I would say, particularly plugged into that scene. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it was the 10 year olds were certainly blind to it, but I think a lot of adults were were too. We also heard from Twitter user I Humble. He says what he will remember most about the 1998 home run race is that, quote, Major League Baseball knew good and damn well that McGuire and Sosa were on the juice, but they did nothing because the home run chase brought people back to baseball after they had a strike. That's that strike you mentioned. Attendance was down. They brought it back up. Did baseball have a good incentive to look the other way? Absolutely. They absolutely did. Um, this, like I said earlier, this made them a lot of money. And, um, I think that, you know, I don't think there was any sort of evidence that Major League Baseball had at the moment that Mark McGuire or Sammy Sosa or Barry Bonds or any of those guys were using steroids. I don't think they had something in their arsenal that they were hiding. I think they were choosing to not find that evidence. Mm -hmm. Um, They they weren't testing. Steroids were illegal. Anabolic steroids were illegal. The government had made them illegal. But baseball did not have an anti-steroid policy. There was no mechanism for testing or punishment. Um, The commissioner of baseball at the time, Bud Selig, made several statements sort of after after the fact that he had to go talk to his pharmacist about what any of these things were. And (laughs) everybody was trying to remain in the dark. (laughs) That's interesting. So your podcast gets into both what happened that season and all the fallout from that season. I want to encourage people to listen to this podcast, Crushed. It's it's a great listen. I think there's two episodes out now of what's going to be a seven-episode series. Um, But Joan, I'm curious about for you, Um, as an individual, did when these revelations finally came out and you were no longer just that baseball-loving 10-year-old, did that change your love affair with baseball? So it probably changed it a bit. I think it made me a bit more skeptical. I think there's always in the back of my mind, uh, if you you get excited about something, you hope it's it's not tainted because something was tainted. Uh, But I still, I mean, I, like I said, I became a sports writer in large part because I really fell in love with baseball and sports at a young age, and I, I still love baseball. I still love watching baseball. Um, but and the Cardinals gave me a lot of other things as a kid to cheer for post McGuire. You know, you go right into the Albert Pujols years and the World Series, and that was you know 2006 was my first World Series of my lifetime. I was born in 1987, so right after a great run, I didn't see any of that, and so. Um, so yeah, it changed things for sure. And I guess the example that I like to give is as the fallout of the steroid era continued and there were congressional hearings in 2005 about this and those hearings sparked the Mitchell Report, which was an investigation into baseball steroid use and that eventually came out and named a bunch of players for using. And I remember being a teenager when that happened and being very concerned that Albert Pujols' name was going to be in the Mitchell report. It wasn't. Hmm. He was he was to no one's knowledge juicing, but I remember thinking, 
oh my gosh, what if? What if another sort of moment I loved in baseball is ruined? And I think that's the legacy of the steroid era to me. Hmm. So what made you want to revisit that era, era to go so in-depth over seven episodes as opposed to, say, the pool holes era, everything's happy? <laughs> You know, I think it's it's a story in baseball that isn't talked about. And um, I ran up into I ran into a lot of walls while reporting this because people still do not want to talk about steroids in baseball. Mm. Um, there's a lot of, I think, self-delusion going on among people involved and a lot of sort of projected delusion onto others. Um, so that was a big part of it. Just what could I learn about this that I that people aren't talking about? And the other thing that I was really interested in with all of this um, is right now we're talking about Mark McGuire and people talk about him. They talk about Sammy Sosa. They talk about Barry Bonds. They talk about these celebrity players who, you know, some have admitted to using steroids. Others have not. They probably did. They probably all did. They are like a percentage of a percentage of a percentage of the total players in Major League Baseball who were playing during the steroid era. And I was very curious what that experience of playing in in the 90s and early 2000s was like for, you know, the average fringe player who's trying to make the big leagues and also trying to string together enough contracts to, you know, put dinner on the table for his family because minor leaguers are paid a pittance. And how did all of this sort of trickle down to the people we don't talk about today? And that was what really hooked me on the idea. Boy, well, if that piques your interest, you will want to listen to this podcast, Crushed. Um, And we've got a link on our website. That's stlpublicradio.org. You can also get it wherever you get your podcasts. It's a production of PRX and Religion of Sports. Um, And Joan Neeson, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun. This is St. Louis on the Air on St. Louis Public Radio, 90.7 KWMU. find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association. Missouri produces wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details on the variety of products made in the state are at ChooseWood.com.